Technology is changing human resource management, but where will it go? A good question might be, what are the technological innovations that will drive human resource technology trends in the future? To elaborate this further, we have a panel discussion on digital HR, an inside look at next-gen technologies is changing the workplace and people practices. I would like to invite Gautam Ghosh, independent consultant, digital HR, to moderate this discussion. I would also like to invite our panel of guests for this session, Priyanka Anand, VP and Head HR, Southeast Asia, Oceania and India, Ericsson. Vishpala Reddy, Head HR, India Subcontinent, Philips. Rajiv Kumar, VP and Country Leader, India, Some Total Systems. Welcome everybody uh, to a discussion on how uh, digital HR is impacting people practices uh, within the organizations. We have Rajiv, uh, Priyanka and Vishpala with me right now. Uh, so let's get on to it straight away. Uh, I want to start off with uh, each of you uh, to find out where your organizations are in, the, in their HR tech journey. If we could start with you, uh, Priyanka. Great, thanks, Gautam. And again, I think that by the virtue of being in the telecom industry, uh, digital transformation has been part of our DNA for, for a long time. Just to give you a semblance, when this whole outburst of pandemic uh, happened, 85,000 employees, uh, Gautam, overnight started working from home in Ericsson across 180 countries. And that was an overnight decision to prioritize employee safety over anything else, right? So we were the first ones to go in, take a decision and get things rolling. The other thing I would say is when we talk about digital, there has been a clear thought through roadmap towards how do we invest in digital up, uh, transformation at Ericsson. So looking at all HR processes and focus on that for, the, uh, for this moment right now, we have an integrated talent management system which touches across all facets of HR, but more importantly, What's really has been our focus right now is not just become an enabler, but also create a, a cultural transformation behind digital transformation. So to us, digital transformation is not just about technology revolution, it's also about a, a cultural revolution. How do we enable leaders to create a democratized setup or environment for our employees, which clearly means we do support anytime, anywhere learning. So we have a platform called the Grid that gives that entire ecosystem. But for us, it's not just about having an ecosystem. It's about how do we let employees create bespoke journeys in terms of they define what are the learning journeys they want to undertake for their current roles, but also for their future aspirations. And likewise, just for a recency effect, we launched an employee assistance program, which was a 24 by seven well-being portal for our employees, providing them assistance on physical, social, financial, and mental well-being. So to us, we've taken technology to the next level, clearly looking at how does technology become an enabler for both business continuity, but also business enhancement. Uh, Vishpala, uh, since I've worked in Philips, I have a little bit of background about Philips' journey. I'd like to, and of course, it was a while back. What has uh, Philips been doing uh, in the Asia Pacific and specifically in India uh, after the deployment of say Workday and Cornerstone. And I know the social cast was there as a collaboration platform. Uh, what else has been happening in Philips uh, in the HR tech journey? Yeah, so I think, I mean, Gautam, good to obviously talk to someone who's ex-Philips. So I'm glad you probably know more even probably more than me because I'm still eight months into the system. But um, on, a, on, a, on a more serious note, I think there are some things a little bit like what Priyanka said, which are related to the pandemic, right? Which is more around business continuity. Uh, so I'm not going to touch about that because I think Priyanka has already spoken about that. But I think what um, surprised me because before Philips, I worked with a tech company. I think the extent of these technological tools that you just mentioned, whether it's Workday, whether it's Yammer, uh, I mean, it's non-negotiable because I've seen some organizations in the past where you have these digital HR tools 
but the adoption is extremely low. So, for example, if you look at Yammer as a social platform today, every single town hall, every single action for an employee is literally only on that platform. So there is no option for the employee but to digitally sort of engage. And obviously, the pandemic just makes it even better, right? Um, I think the second thing, like Priyanka mentioned, and I think for most HR functions, and I think Philips morphed during the COVID piece, while I think we have a great university or a learning sort of platform, but just the fact that the push to kind of go digital for all curriculums, right, like key capabilities as well as all curriculums has happened uh, literally in 2020. So I think that was great to see as well. And I think the third piece is just in terms of engagement platforms, which uh, I don't know at your time if it did happen, but the pandemic has pushed every company and, and Philips is no different. It's just virtual employee engagement, whether it's the fun stuff, whether it's the serious stuff around mental health, whether it is, um, you know, like talking to different experts. So I think just engagement has kind of gone virtual. So if you ask me as an HR practitioner, like the three buckets would be business continuity, learning and engagement. And then you have the tools, right? Your basic tools of how you kind of store data and how employees are probably accessing data because the whole feedback piece, Gautam, which I don't think probably existed when you were there, this whole using Workday to capture anytime feedback has also been a huge cultural shift. Right. Uh, Rajiv, uh, you've been working with different clients, uh, I guess, over the last uh, one year of this uh, pandemic. How, uh, I mean, uh, which clients have made progress and what has stopped other clients from making progress? Uh, if I could get your perspective as a, you know, uh, service provider, partner uh, with various HR organizations, learning organizations. Sure. Uh, thank Gautam. So, so, uh, so when uh, pandemic hit, right, everybody had a had a backup plan. So everybody had certain what if models, right? Everything that if something like this happens, we should do this. But I think when the pandemic hit, none of the models worked. The only thing that people were expecting, and I think uh, most of our customers, and we also have almost thousand people in India. I think everybody was expect, expecting the employees to be resilient, agile, adaptable. I think what so we started working. So today uh, we work with almost 70% of Fortune 500 companies globally. And I think one mantra that possibly uh, worked for us internally and for many of our uh, global customers was an approach, which is about saying that, okay, whether it was yesterday, whether it is today, whether it's going to be tomorrow, con content is going to be key. Now, content is not about what you get from Skillsoft, Coursera, plural sort, uh, plural site. It is about what you need to communicate. What has changed uh, for most of the organization is the context. So it is not about the content which is the king. It is the context which has become the king. So with context becoming the king, it is important for uh, organizations and that's for some of the large IT services companies like Cognizant, Wipro, TechCam, Hexaware in India actually did was started building teams, started collaborating with teams and started communicating. And not only did they communicate, they use our platform to actually look at, in its true sense, the Kirkpatrick model, which is about noticing the reaction to whatever that they were communicating, noticing the reaction, noticing the change in behavior. And with all these changes, they were about to bring in new uh, processes, new ways of approaching the cust uh, their customers. Because I think what has changed for HR today is they become very integral to business. So it's not only about taking care of my internal customers, but also ensuring that they have a better understanding of the business that they serve, which is understanding what the customer wants, what the end customer wants. So I think everything that some of these organizations were able to do using our platform was to make the teams much more uh, communicative, much more agile, much more inclusive in whatever that they were doing. Uh, Priyanka Vishwala, a specific question to you. What did you do to uh, guide your HR business partners, HR uh, uh, functional leaders, uh, COEs, and how did you how did you gu guide them in making that uh, you know leap into from real life face to face HR to virtual HR engagement? So I think I got a good question, and to me, I think what was important was to first recognize that you know unless you are taking care of yourself, it's difficult to take care of the people around you. So first things first, establishing a connect with, with my own team, 
making them understand that we are around, we are there as a team, and we've got to do a balancing act of taking care of the people that we're responsible for, but also drawing support from the larger team was important as a big message, right? Doing all the right things for our own team that we expected our teams to do for the larger organization, number one. Secondly, when it comes to competence, I don't think there was a big competence shift that was needed to cater to the situation. What was needed was a whole mindset shift, you know? And for me, things that we've invested in has been, you know, looking at every crisis or a challenge with a growth mindset as an opportunity. And to me, what we really accelerated was a cultural shift, which clearly said, let's look at how can we be more empathetic and human as a team, but more importantly, how do we coach our leaders to become more empathetic and human? So I think where I was coming from, see the whole empathy and humanness piece became important for, for leaders to experience uh, and then deliver that experience back to the employees. Secondly, we also did launch a survey uh, to look at how employees were experiencing this whole period post COVID, right? Or during COVID. And we called it, called it a COVID pulse survey. And we got feedback from our own people or employees on what they were experiencing. And hence the second thing we did was analyze those trends and look at how people were experiencing a very high degree of stress. And then we went ahead and launched a whole campaign around speak up that don't experience what you're experiencing in isolation, in solitude, but please bring up, speak up and talk to us, you know, talk to your managers, talk to your peers, talk to HR. So how my team became a big ambassador of this whole speak up culture. We started many forums where people could come, talk, connect. And the third, like I said, it was important to create a safety net for our employees. So we created a platform called employee assistance program that I just spoke about that created an anytime, anywhere touch point for our people, including the HR organization, Gotham. So long story short, everything together was only focusing on one big culture movement that we were driving. How do we as a team in these tough times come together to collaborate and cooperate in many more former manners than ever before? And that in turn ensured that, you know, as a company, we just didn't survive this phase, but we thrived. So if you look at our financial performances, our stock price, we've taken it a notch above than even everybody's expectations because all this together became an enabler for employees to focus on what they needed to do to keep organize this organization, which is Ericsson, ahead of the curve. Uh, Vishpala, over to you. Yeah, sure. I mean, makes sense, Priyanka. Um, I think, I mean, some similarities and maybe a little bit like, at least my approach, Gautam, I think for the HR team initially, right, when the pandemic broke, it was, if you ask me, the key skill was to hustle, right, which not necessarily as a function we've always done, right, because irrespective of industry, people had to probably come together, we didn't know the answers, there was a lot that was kind of unveiling. You had to kind of ensure that there was business continuity. But okay, how do I get PPE kits? Or like, what is the protocol on like COVID in terms of reporting internally and internally? So, so I just feel like hustle, like it's a overused term, but it was a key skill that I think the, the HR teams, I would pretty much think across companies would have done, but definitely at Philips, right? I think the second piece, if I think of just capabilities, post the first couple of months, then it's a little bit more about, hey, are we kind of trying different things? I think Priyanka touched upon that. Like just coaching some of our people managers or, you know, I think the HR team did a fabulous job of ensuring that uh, you ensured that productivity was there because at the end of the day, that was a key metric for every organization. You're doing some things new, you're probably testing uh, some things. And for example, in say manufacturing plants, you still had to operate with 25% sort of a workforce. So that means licensing with the government, the state governments. So it was, again, I think a different skill, but it was almost kind of keeping the ship steady. So it went to hustle, it went to this. And if you look at, if you ask me the last quarter and as we sit right now, it's a little bit more, I think the expectation from the team is the biggest ask today from the business is, how does return to work look like, right? Because if you're going to go back to the old normal, I do think we're missing an opportunity. So whether we're hearing lots of announcements across the globe about organizations changing their models of work and Philips is no different, but yet what is that sort of uh, strategy which is unique to the company, right? Like where you kind of still focus on probably innovation, et cetera. So I would say right now the focus or the key skill is how are you kind of looking into the future? And the last comment is Gotham, 
I do think, and this is my personal reflection, sometimes as a function, it has been a tough year, right? Because there was a lot of eyes on HR. And I think there was a lot of pressure in a, in a different sense, like trying to figure it all. And I think there were moments which at least we've acknowledged to say, like a little bit like what Priyanka said, should we pause like as a function, like how are we feeling? How are we doing? And I think there's more to be done there. Uh, but fortunately, hopefully 2021 is a different year and a better year. Um, and Vishwala, you talked about this, but I want to kind of get uh, Rajiv and uh, Priyanka's because a lot of work around collaboration. So HR tech is one part, but there's this new evolving uh, part, which is called work tech, which essentially is collaboration platforms like Yammer, Social Cast, Social Text, and the others, Microsoft Teams, uh, Zoom also. But some, are, some asynchronous, some synchronous, uh, uh, some with text, uh, some with video. Uh, how are these tools, uh, and these tools are not necessarily bought by HR, uh, a, a function like a marketing or a sales function can go ahead and because there are cloud-based uh, solutions, how does uh, HR keep a track or uh, are you, what is the protocol of getting people to collaborate without really, uh, you know, there's, part of data sensitivity also. So, uh, and specifically Rajiv, in your organizations, uh, and I know what's the way that you collaborate? Uh, do you eat your own dog food or are you using other uh, collaboration software? How, how does it work for you? Okay, so I think uh, uh, this, I'll take a possibly a pause and talk about something. See, what has changed fundamentally in last 10 months is what would have taken almost a decade to change, right? So we never thought that maybe uh, in an A-class city or a B-class city, people will actually accept digital so much, right? Uh, so this would have taken almost a decade for people to behave like this. And now people are behaving uh, with the new technologies. Uh, if all goes well, I think we should potentially be seeing a GDP growth of 8% by end of next year. Now, now there's a business context and then you actually come back into the organization and say, okay, how do you ensure collaboration, which is with the end role of making your organization digital and to support a digital economy. Uh, yes, we, we were not using our systems as effectively and you were right, not many organizations actually do it. Uh, but one thing that we started using was our own technology. We said, okay, we have a great learning management system. We have a great performance management system. We have succession planning and we have, most importantly, a 360-degree feedback mechanism, right? We started using them. And yes, you're right. Most of the technologies that are adopted in the organization are generally done by, especially the collaboration tools, are done by either marketing or sales. It is HR which had a challenge to not only adapt it, but then make it uh, the core or become make it a heart of the organization. Because we said, okay, 360 degree feedback becomes the core of everything because there were people who were working from home. Suddenly the pandemic hit and we had people who went to their hometowns. Right. And the things changed because we are also a development organization. We have 800 people. So it was not so our, our entire business model changed, which is now we were not working in a local India team, but we had resources available to us across the geographies. So some of these technologies that we started adopting, which is our own technologies, helped us collaborate better. And I think uh, everything that we had to do, uh, we had to bring a policy in place. So HR became the heart of everything, wherein they had to use some of, bring these technologies as part of the policy. So it was everything. For example, today, if I get into a call, we even ensured that people, people initially had reservations of not coming on camera. So we sometimes looked at HR business partners to informally communicate and sensitize people that you need to see people when they talk. You need to interact with them. You need to feel them. So I think HR did play a very critical role in making people sensitive and helping the organization adopt to some of the technologies that we were selling to our customers and not using ourselves. And, uh, Gautam, if I can just add like one statement on this, right? Um, 
I, I feel like the role that HR plays here, like we are not the technology or the tool experts, right? I mean, you have a technology function in every organization who chooses what tools to adopt and how do you deploy. So I personally feel like that's not our role. Our role is being those change enablers and enabling that adoption of the technology, right? A little bit like what Rajiv said. Um, so I, I think it's more linked to the culture and it's a non-negotiable, right? Like, as I just said, like in the future, collaboration would probably look very different than sitting in a room and writing on a whiteboard, right? So I think the, the, the skill that we need to have is are we pushing enough to say, is the technology inclusive enough to probably meet the needs of that newer workforce demands? I mean, that's our role, but I don't think our role is, okay, let's pick tool A versus tool B and let's deploy it. I, I don't think that's our role, honestly. Yeah. Right, and I think Gautam, I'll just, I think both Rajiv and Vishpal have really added a lot of context to your question. The only thing I would say is having invest, invested in technology ecosystem is a given, right? I don't see any organization today would have survived this whole pandemic outburst unless they had a huge investment towards technology in the foundation of how they are operating today. And that became a little bit like a, a real game changer to switch to make a shift from how we were using the old normal to move towards the new normal. To me, what was important was we had to activate two of our biggest advantages or levers in this uh, whole post pandemic situation, which was one was leaders. And what we did very quickly was, while technology was delivered, we ensured that leaders were coached to become effective virtual leaders because that's one big shift that we had. Everything was going virtual overnight and leaders had to become equipped to lead teams virtually to transition from being just leaders or managers to become coaches because it's not about here and now. Employees were stressed about, you know, is my career going to come to an end? Is it stalled? Because it's, is it all about what I'm doing? No. How do we make them coaches to look at not just the here and now, but also the future? And the third thing I would say is extremely important. How do we as a culture make it evident to people that it's not about individual success, it's collective success. So to me, tools became the enablers, but the whole culture shift about virtual leaders, virtual coaches, about having collective success and leaders coach to become empathetic and human. Understanding everybody was coming from a different level of reality, being stressed about their safety, well-being, their aging parents, you know, the situation around you, the medical situation was collapsing. So all this required people to take a leapfrog jump into the new normal. And, and to me, that kind of collaboration and cooperation shift is what we had to make. Investment in technology has always been part of the uh, game-changing strategy, but that was a given. That's how I would see it. Right. Uh, what do you think uh, are some of the tools and technologies that you are evaluating to, you know, go forward? What, uh, I mean, we were hearing a lot about artificial intelligence, machine learning, chatbots, uh, do you think these are just buzzwords as of now, or uh, are you actively using them or evaluating them uh, going forward? Whoever, uh, if anybody is actually using them, do let us know how it is working out, uh, what capabilities in HR are they adding value to? Yeah. Or if not, yeah. if you are acti actively thinking of uh, deploying or evaluating some of them, also do let us know. Gautam, I have a live example to share, right? And this is more within Philips, is that we're actually using an AI-based, and this is an India-only pilot, so it's not a globally rolled out uh, tool. It's an AI-based uh, engagement tool, which is very cool. It's, uh, it's called Amara. It's not a Philips proprietary tool, uh, but which pretty much goes to like traditional in employee engagement surveys as you do once a quarter, questions, blah, blah. We all know the drill. But I think this tool is so intuitive. It's in a, in a chat box format where it's personalized questions and content depending on a response and I think the insights are fantastic so we've kind of used this every time there's a major change or a major transformation as well as during the pandemic and at least the HR team is very excited to see I think the results that it's throwing up so we've kind of made a decision that we want to continue to leverage this tool which sits over and above our regular engagement service so I think that's a live example of how we're using artificial intelligence I think um Again, more on where will we see, I feel like the recruiting space is something that um, while I've seen pilots in the past, but I haven't seen huge returns, right? There are amazing products out there that exist in terms of the, the recruiting space, but I just feel like maybe because I've always worked with large corporations, um, the adoption of these tools in HR 
right? Because it always starts as tests and pilots, but I've never seen them sort of scale up. So if you ask me like my wish list, I just feel like we can do so much more on that. And I think the third and the last area is a little bit on learning, which I think Priyanka and Rajiv spoke about. I think every company is talking about how do you customize content and push the right content from a learning standpoint? How do you personalize sort of career path things? So again, there are some good tools, but again, is it fully integrated? The answer is no. So more to come there, but um, I would say in a scale of zero to 10, we probably are more in the four or five. I don't think we're hitting as a function, you know, the nines and the tens yet. Erica? Okay, I'll go next then. I think Rajiv, of course, you'll have lots more to add. But I would say, I think I'm fortunate to say that over the last decade or so, we've had huge investments and some cutting edge tools that our employees can experience, right? So when it comes to degree when it, in learning and development space, when it comes to having, like I said, the whole integrated talent management system, having a chat bot, having a 24 by seven chat support uh, to our employees, ensuring that we have tools like montage, which is video interviewing, takes it to the next level, right? The pre-screening happens over a video with the candidate and, and the application. They have Texito, which takes away all the diversity or the, uh, the, the biases, gender biases from the job description. So we've used technology. Now we've just signed up with Eightfold, which creates an end-to-end -end talent application tracking system. We do have success factors implemented already in Ericsson. So to me, technology has been a given investment and we've been constantly on the hunt saying, what else can we got, get onto the brand wagon to enhance the entire offering to our employees? But for me, the real asset test is about how are we moving the needle on employee experience, right? So the technology will always exist and we'll continue to invest, rehash what we can offer. We tie up with, with vendors who can provide us a lot of those uh, technology tools, it's not homegrown because we're not looking at creating those proprietary content or tools and applications ourselves. But we have, like I said, this whole employee assistance program, we've got a technology that supports 24 by seven. So to me, the whole mindset about technology becoming an enabler, whether it's communication through Yammer, through Teams, through whatever you talk about under the sky, right? We have access to all those technologies within Ericsson. The thing that we are driving, like I said, digital transformation is not a technology transformation. It's a culture transformation. How do we enable leaders to drive that mindset change like Vishwala was talking about within our employees, right? Because adoption becomes the largest win. Unless we make adoption happen, it will only be investment sitting in one pocket of the whole organization. And that's where we've really accelerated our investment, leaders being equipped, shown what it really means when you have democratized access to data, to tools, and how we can have more dynamic and uh, versatile career opportunities for people, which will keep them both engaged and empowered within the organization. So to me, if unless we do all of this, we will never have an engaged and, em and empowered set of employees who will be the enablers to take business to the next level. Over to you, Rajiv. Okay, I think uh, AI, ML, chatbot, this is given. If you today uh, uh, look at a tool, technology, whatever, if it is not there, I think it's historic. Uh, like Vishwana said, and Pranka, you also mentioned about experience, right? So I think I would still focus and uh, about one point, which is context. Everything is going to be contextual. We have adopted technology which gives you everything. But is it contextual? Is it actually addressing what my employee wants? Look at Netflix, for example. And this is what I keep telling. Netflix, right? Netflix, I go and watch an action movie. Uh, I watch it for three minutes or four minutes. And suddenly what happens is I get start getting recommendation of all that action movies. What sometimes Netflix doesn't know is that I'm not an action focused person. I am more of a romantic person, for example. And I sh should be given that option as well. So today I don't get an option to... So today, I think if I look at that Netflix experience, I should be able to not only get recommendations of what I should be learning i should also get be able to pull in recommendations of what i want to learn it has to be both ways okay and today and that's for context becomes important and if context is important i think any of the tools and technology and everybody has it they will become better in improving employee experience i think it's only about another word that i always use is addiction if we any technology in its heart believes in getting addicted somebody gets addicted to it whether it is the technology or whether it's people 
or the leaders, if they get addicted to their people and technology gets addicted to individuals, I think you will see the results that the technology should be delivering. I think addiction is very, very important, whether it is people getting addicted to people or technology getting addicted to people. So we always expect employees to get addicted. I think you have to possibly change the uh, entire approach and say, can technology get addicted to my people? And they become, if you're talking about AI and ML, I think technology has to start getting addicted to people because that is the place where rubber hits the road, right? Okay. Uh, I think we're uh, kind of uh, come to the end of our discussion. Just a final question, quick reactions. We look talking a lot about data being generated by all these technology systems. How are HR people using people analytics data uh, to take decisions around hiring, engagement, promotions, uh, other uh, uh, learning? So Gautam, I think like, I mean, we all have to acknowledge and HR is no different. Data is the new oil, right? Data is king. I mean, simply put, there's no choice, right? That's one. Second is like, if you ask me like aspiration, vision, dream, whatever, like today, every time you are in a management review, right? Finance has this detailed scorecard where your eyes are kind of going so to even read the number of metrics, right? That's the one extreme. Like I would say like our vision should be as a function that is there something similar, right? Where all of HR is looking at some of those key metrics, which becomes an industry standard that every time you review people metrics, you are going to hit those 10 things. And it's pretty acceptable as you enter the organization. I mean, that would be ideal. The third thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, I've had the advantage of having a people analytics function in one of the companies that I worked. And it's unbelievable what you can do and how it opens up in terms of just insights, in terms of influencing the business. Because, again, like data just speaks volumes versus I want to do, you should do, I think you should do, right? So I feel like HR, again, my personal belief is doing okay can it do more as a function 100 percent, and that's i think my personal endeavor as a hr leader to bring data more into the forefront as you influence sort of key people decisions to me again gautam maybe you know i've got to take a little bit of a, a breath of a relief because since 2014 we've had a function called workforce planning and analytics at ericsson so to me Analytics is the eye of the fish. That's how we run the HR function. That's where we, we see that we have the muscle power to transform business and became, become a partner enablers to how business can accomplish their own visions and their own goals, right? And to me, I think having access to data is a thing of the past because people have to have access to the data. There has to be a data-driven decision-making. That has been one of our key fundamental cultural shift that we've dri been driving over a decade now. When I'm now looking forward to and where we, are, we have been treading on that path for some time now, is how do we make a move from being real-time data, data provider to being more proactive? How do we ensure that managers at a click of a button have access to the data that they need versus we as HR providing the data to them? So to me, I'm a big sponsor of the word called data democratization, which really means person who needs the data has an access to it at a, at a drop of a hat, right, or a click of a button. And that's where we are moving towards now. To me, any manager today can track the history of an employee from their performance ratings to their learning journeys to how their feedback uh, has been or how they've uh, evolved into their different performance zones. So all that data sits at a drop of a button for a manager, including compensation to ranges to benchmarking. Everything's available in a system for a manager at Ericsson today. When I'm going to really focus on now is becoming more predictive, getting into more trending. How can we, with that data, start to predict how the future trends, needs will evolve for leaders? How do we make a competence shift? So if I can track the competence investments we've done as a company, what shift are we making? And again, looking at from a whole, so in telecom, for, of course, you guys will know, from a 2G to 5G evolution happened in just a spread of a decade, right? So. If we are reactive in looking at the competence shift being made, we will never be able to win the game. To be ahead of the curve, we've got to look at what competence shifts we need to make today to be ahead of the game of the industrial technology requirements tomorrow. So to me, again, two things, data democratization, looking at more predictive analytics and ensuring that people are taking fact-based decisions versus gut-based decisions. That's like a given. Otherwise, we haven't succeeded in this space. But again, a lot to do here. 
on technology, we have invested hugely on, on Tableau to a lot of other things to be able to get those analytics, like I said, success factors and many other tools. Over to you, Rajiv. Rajiv, uh, both uh, within your organization and what are you seeing your uh, customers, uh, clients uh, journey in uh, data analytics? So first thing is, uh, so I think HR analytics, I'll first for, uh, talk about HR analytics, which Bala spoke about. See, today when I go and sell my solution to any HR leader or a CEO of an organization, I think one important thing that they st started asking, and this is a shift that I have started seeing uh, since the pandemic hit, is where an HR head is talking about return on investment. Why should I invest in your technology? Do I get an ROI? What is the total cost of ownership? And I think HR analytics has, so everything, whether it's learning, whether it's performance, whether it's succession, or any other tool, I think HR analytics is the key uh, point at on which the decisions are made. And so there's been a huge shift uh, of HR and business both focusing, and more HR focusing on HR analytics. The second point, which Priyanka said, is also something which I've said, uh, been witnessing for the last one and a half years now, is data democratization. Any initiative, any HR initiative obviously has a buy-in from the top. And poor uh, junior folks, right? They have to anyway adopt it. They don't have an option. I think the roadblock happens at the middle management where they believe that they will end up doing a lot of more work. Now that they were okay with paper, doing everything on paper, now new technology comes and that is the place where there is a lot of resistance. I think Analytics is something which is the key to making their life better. When they know that they will get this report with a click of the button, they will start accepting and adopting the technology. So I think data democratization, therefore, has a very different spin. Analytics with data democratization can make technologies successful in every organization. And you're seeing a lot of uh, I customers doing that. Today, without a, so first discussion that any customer would do is around analytics. What happens in terms of individual development plans, skills, competencies, succession planning? Do I take care of KPIs, KRS? That is secondary. First, tell me what is the power of analytics in your solution? That has been a huge change, especially in last one year when there is a lot of budget pressure on HR as a function. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, we've kind of run out of time. Uh, thank you, Priyanka, Vishwala, Rajiv. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts. Stay tuned for the next session.